All right. I will make I and I continue with this. So this is the biblical, or we could say possible, but I think there's more probable than possible to this. But let's just call it the biblical um, origins of the orma, question mark. I put the question mark because, of course, ones will say, that's your opinion. Well, we're going to present evidence and in presenting this evidence ones can come to their own decision like we said this is not you know we we wasn't and and it bothers us a little bit now because we wasn't really too interested in the Ottoman, you know and other tribes you know like we were interested in Hala Selassie and 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 his tribe and then we found well his majesty has Ottoman links some try to dismiss that and try to say that there's no truth to it, but the facts basically have proven that, yes, it is true. The Ormo, you can look it up perhaps on the Wikipedia if you want to, you know, though some people might say there's some questionable stuff, but at least it's a, it's a, it's a good start. Don't say, well, because it's there, it's, it's the end-all and be-all, but then try to verify and, like they say, vet that out. So we have right here the Ormo equals the Romans, or Roman or the ancient Romans, and let's put a question mark here. Now, those of us in the Afrocentric and black liberation, as it's often called, usually by the distractors for detracting and distracting reason, but those who are in the Afrocentric community know that um, the ancient, many of the ancient so called great Europeans, at least the, the foundation of these cultures, were black. We call it gentrification today where black people are in a certain community or area, and like Brooklyn, look at Brooklyn today. And now you get all the nations. The nations will move in, and, and they may keep up the appearance of it. You understand? They want to own this, this, this great or this modern kind of legend. You know, they, they move into these areas, and before you know it, um, the so-called like, like Bed-Stuy is becoming more gentrified with the Gentiles, coming into that community, but originally it was what we call the hood. You understand? So how is this any different than other places in the world? We find that this has happened in other periods of time in history as well. Now, the Kibbutz and the Guest, and in its um, modern um, translation here, it goes right here, the Kibbutz and the Guest, which is, this is one of the, we would say the best translation. We put it on the same level as the King James Bible, and I know there's a lot to be said on King James Bible, but we don't stop there. We can go into the Ethiopic them hard, but we use that as a basic reference point of reference for those who may be somewhat linguistically um, challenged or if they don't have any, any motivation to overcome that linguistically handicapped. But this is the um, Queen of Sheba and only son Minulik, right? And in this particular document, it states... A relationship that some have thrown as being so-called mythological or some have put as speculative or some have even questioned the historicity of the fact that it mentioned that the king of Ethiopia and the king of Rome, the true king of Rome, are actually brothers, you understand, because they have the same father in King Solomon being the father of the true king of um Rome, as well as the king of Ethiopia, who we know as Minulik, Baina Lechem, Ebron Hakim, um, or David the second. Now let's see if we get the chapter over here where it talks about in chapter 117 of the Kibr Neges translation, Queen of Sheba and only son Minulik, but the translation that means the glory of kings it states that the king of Rome and the king of Ethiopia, right, and let's go to the king of Rome and the king of Ethiopia briefly. Just give you a quick background on what we have in the background right here. And uh, in chapter 117, chapter 117 right here, it says, concerning the king of Rome, or Rome, Rome, Rome and the king of Ethiopia, the king of Rome and the king of Ethiopia and the archbishop of Alexandria. Now the men of Rome were orthodox, were informed that they were to destroy 
them, and they were to rise up to fight and to make war upon the enemies of God, and it says the Jews, right, and to destroy them, the king of Rome, Enya, and the king of Ethiopia, Pinhas, or Phineas, 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 or Phi Nahas, and they were to lay waste their lands and to build churches there, and they were to cut to pieces, it says, Jews at the end of this cycle in 12 cycles of the moon. Very interesting. Now, a point of order, because the Ethiopians are Judeo as well. But the difference is that it's speaking of the Jews or the so-called Jews who do not accept the uh, Moshiach, those who don't accept the Moshiach or the Messiah, and who were part of that uh, crucifixion of um, our black Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it says, Then the kingdom of the Jews shall be made an end of, and the kingdom of Christ shall be constituted until the advent of the false Messiah. Now, it goes further, and there's a very interesting explanation right here. Now, elsewhere where it speaks about the king of Rome and the king of Ethiopia is when it mentions Solomon's other son. Now, we know that King Solomon, at least in modern times, is heavily associated with uh, masonry or Freemasonry or the so-called Illuminati. And therefore, this is also another very, very important link in this whole so-called matrix. But the, the, the area that we wanted to present, okay, right here. Um, uh, it says, uh, chapter 73, it mentions Adrami, 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 who is the king of Rome. Then it says, concerning the king of Rome, and is speaking of at Constantinople. And it says right here, and when King Solomon, page 122, chapter 72 of the Kibra Neges, in translation, the Queen of Sheba and only son Minulik, and when King Solomon had read this letter, he, he meditated, saying, If I keep back my son, he will send to the king of the east. Who will give him his son? And that which I have planned will be made void. Therefore, I will give him my son. And he took counsel with the counselors of the house of Israel and said to them, We have already given our son and our children to the country of Ethiopia. And Israel hath a kingdom there. And now, so that we may have a third kingdom, the country of Rome, I will send thither or there Adramis, my youngest son. Hold ye not it against me as an evil thing that formerly I took away your sons. For it is a pleasing thing to God, to El Elohe Israel or Hashem, Ha Elohim, the true God or the God of Israel, that the men of Ethiopia, Ethiopia have learned his name and have become his people. In like manner, the men of Rome, or Rome, if we give them our children, will become the people of God, and to us, moreover, shall be given the name of people of God, being spoken of thus and called thus. The people of Israel have taken the kingdom of Ethiopia and the kingdom of Rome. Give ye your youngest sons, as before ye gave the eldest, and let those of middle age stay in our city. So it, here King Solomon, Solomon had a plan. There was a Solomonic plan of, one could call it the, the, the Hebrew New World Order, for lack of a better word. And um, part of it was in agreement with God's plan, namely Ethiopia and the kingdom of David being reestablished in Ethiopia. But he also had this idea that from many of the wives he had, he would have children from them, and therefore his seed. He was looking at the victory more through the, to the five cycle, or we can even say the melanated, or the, through that physical seed. You know what I'm saying? And in the process, um, well, we know what happened with Solomon and, and um, a lot of his compliance with a lot of practices which undermine the old kingdom of Israel. Some say he already saw the vision.
and he knew from the vision that it was Ethiopia that was chosen. And um, perhaps that affected his judgment, some would say. But now, still one would say, well, what does this have to do with Ormo and the possible Roman connection? I mean, look at this word for a moment. Let's go Rome, right? Rome. In the Amharic, we, we write it like this, Rome, right? Rome. Now, Oromo. So we have Romo, right? Romo. In Amharic, that N at the end, the N at the end is called a direct object uh, marker, uh, grammatically. So if we have a verb in Amharic, for example, and we want to point that the verb to this now, we may say a Romain, a Romain, like Yinesal, Yuelkal, like, or, 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 or something is the verb is directly affecting this noun. This N is added. So that means that the N that's added, when we look at the older forms of it, we find that it's without any N, and Rome itself is without that. So let's continue to look at this right here. Let's see. Okay, there we go. Okay, we have Rome. I don't know if you can see this, this marker going out right here. See, the enemy doesn't want this particular teaching to get through, you know, because it will clear up a lot of confusion among our brothers and sisters. Because, see, uh, the Europeans, they, they, they know more than they like to tell. You have to find it for yourself, and they'll say, no, 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 and you have to prove it. So we have Romo, but all Romo. Then we have Rome, right, Rome. Now, if we look at the primary, the primary um, consonants, the primary consonants are the same, and the vowels here are consistent, oromo. Here is no first vowel sound. It is just rome and the me right there. Now, in Ethiopia, if you're from a certain part of Ethiopia, for example, if you're from Gonda, like Gonda, 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 it's a Gonda re, you know? If you're from a certain place, they add this a this A at the end, which could be a way of saying my, like the yeah, Hagare, 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 my country, you know, Gondare or, you know, um, Walaye, and there's other ways, but at the end, it's this A sound. The A sound is what we are pointing to linguistically, grammatically, linguistically. But now, so we see this linguistic connection between the two. Now, modern automos have chosen to use the Latin, right, instead of the Amharic to, to write their, um, to communicate their language. They find that under the Amhara regimes or the Davidic kingdoms that the Salamanites and the Davidic empire of Ethiopia has been brutal to them. And um, we can understand that to, to some extent coming from our own particular history as Gullah, you understand, which is a link with Gala, all the same. And we can put this right here, that we have Gullah, that link right there. But, okay, what's the biblical? What's still the biblical link? First of all, we just want to show that from just this right here would be enough to say, all right, we got something to go on. Maybe there's more to this in addition to the fact that the early um, the Roman emperors, certain Roman emperors, especially during the Christian times in particular, were black, like Severanus and, and, and others. We touched on this when we had spoke on... Um, on the black Britain's connection and black people in Europe and many of the Afrocentric scholars and others have also gone into the fact that in addition to others besides um, Augustine, if you know about the Christian Catholic father, they call him Augustine, he was from North Africa, that majority of North Africa and even along the coast of the Red Sea, in particular, Africa was Christian. You understand? Know Early Africa was predominantly Christian before the Islamism or Mohammedanism 
came in and started to change up that particular dynamic. It was it was basically so called um post Mohammedans Islam that overran Africa at many vital areas and basically rechanged the whole the whole dynamic of it from being Christian to being um Islamic, as we can see, the state of Africa, and a lot of that is based on what occurred then. Now, just from this right here, there, there is the Automo and the Rome connection, even from the Automos themselves choosing, and I'm sure that it hasn't been lost on them, Oromo, Romo, Romo, Rome. If we look at the slight difference between this right here and Automo right here, we have in Amharic to use um, the Amharic letters. We have Oromo. We have Oromo right there, and we take off the O since O, even in the Gutas and the Tigrinya and some of the other Ethiopic languages, is like someone saying saying Hoy, like when they say Hey, Hey, O, O such and such in Arabic, they may say Ya. Like to say, Ya Muhammad, you understand? Ones may say, Antahoy, or in the Tigrinya sense, would say, O, like, O Kedus Abat, O Kedus Abatoy, you understand? O Kedus Abat, O Kedus Abat, or Kedus Abatoy. If that was Arabic, they'll say, Ya Ba, Ya Ba, as they say, Ya Muhammad. So they use Ya in, say, Arabic, or they use, um, um, hoy at the end in the Amharic or in the Gutas and Tigrinya sometimes use O as um, um, exclamation, calling attention, like saying, you there, hey, hey. When we say, hey, hey, it's a derivation of the hoy from the Ethiopic and, and, in, and in England they say, oi, 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 oi. You understand? Oi, oi. So that oi, so without the H, the H gets dropped off. Now, that's all very linguistical, but once again, we can see a clear link between these two, that here is O-Romo, and then we have Ro-Me, you understand? And the only big major difference is the, the vowel sounds, but predominantly, the consonants remain the same. So, even right here, we have the Ormos using Latin, choosing to use Latin instead of Amharic and instead of um, the Ethiopic script, right? We have the linguistic similarity. Now, I think this in itself, you know, and we kind of knew this from before. We made this, that sort of connection before. Now, what really, in a sense, opened our eyes, and remember I said a little bit earlier that the Almighty um, will lead you into certain directions, even of study and research, that you might not have been intending on studying or researching, topics that you might not have been overly concerned about or really that interested as the topics that I've been interested in, those things I, I personally wanted to study. And this wasn't something that I really wanted to study, but I said uh, coming across the facts and the evidence, it's some injustice I would be doing to my Ethiopian people, whether they are Oromo, Amhara, Tigrinya, Afar, or, or other Africans, and, and even white folks, and just, just humanity, period, if we did not share this. Now, in the truth, for full disclosure, we have begun to, to write um, certain documentation on some of this research, especially much of the deeper um, evidence and, and the more detailed evidence it's too much to present in such a means as we're doing now. This is more or less saying to ones, if you're interested in this, a couple of things we want to say, you want to share um, what we know about this, and hopefully we'll get the book out there that can be one, um, one avenue. You know, the Gullah and the Gala connection was really very interesting to us, and most of the information, it would be a little bit tedious to present it just in this means right here, but some of the highlights we can present between the Oromo and the Roman, the Oromo and the Roman connection, because there were blacks 
In other words, there were Romans who were black. You know, saying this is well known even in the so-called Holy Roman Empire. Many of the leading um, clerics and churchmen and bishops in in early Christianity time were black. Were black people. I mean, this is clear. This is known. It's been suppressed, but it's very clearly known and clearly articulated, as well as certain um, Roman or Byzantine, Byzantine emperors were also of the black race, of the black persuasion. So why would it be, should be difficult that there is a possible link between the people that we call or know today as the Ormo and the black Romans? So we have the Ormos and the ancient black Romans. Now, ones will say, well, Africa is over there. And, and Rome is there, and they would wonder in their mind, how could people get from here to there? They travel. They migrate. When climate and, and things are suitable, they move there. When they see the turn and the tide is changing, they exodus or they leave there. You understand? And plus, there was many persecutions of the black presence in Europe, especially with the rise of white supremacy, that also gives us other um, possible reasons for that um, the change. You understand the change. Now, this is this is just a basic etymological link, but the main point now is the biblical evidence. And I'm I apologize once again by giving some of the background, though I know for some this will be interesting. Others are just waiting for like the punchline, so forth and so on, but. The original, the Ormo say, right? The Ormo say, and not not Rasia Dinos, not Wendem Yada, but the Ormo say that their name actually comes from Elm Orma. Elm Orma. This is what the this is this is what the Ormo say. The Ormos have testified, and, and we're not talking about just recent Ormos, but this is pretty well established, and many of the Ormos who know, you know, saying this part of their history and culture say that their name derives from the Ilm Ormo, and the Ilm Ormo was translated to mean either the people of Orma, excuse me, Ilm Orma, or the sons of Orma. Now, in our research of this and the linguistics of it, we found something very, very interesting. That this name Orma, they say, might have been some, some ancestor or hero, a particular ancestor or hero of the people that we know today as the, as the Orma. So Ilm, Orma, mean the sons or the people of Orma, and Orma is one of their own ancient heroes from which they derive the modern Oromo um, designation and name. But this name right here, Orma, in the Amharic Bible, is actually, this thing is, let's get the other marker. The name in the Ethiopic Bible is actually Orna. It's not it's not orma, but it's actually or na. Now, if you know the linguistics, the change between the n and the m, whether we say anbesa, you know, some say anbesa for lion, for the African lion. Some say um, ambesa, ambesa or anbesa. So the change between the two. So when we look at this particular individual. Orna. Orna is a very, very important individual. And guess in whose story? In the Davidic story, in the story of great King David. You understand? Therefore, if this is true that the Ormos derive their name from the expression Ilm Orma, and that Orma may have been a hero, one of their ancestors that was regarded as a great hero, although they have forgotten or seem to have forgotten exactly what were the circumstances 
from which they derived that this Or Ma was a great hero. The Bible record actually gives us the evidence, and here is where it is very, very interesting. And this is what we want you to stay tuned for as we can try to get some um, better markers so we can tag this up and write this up and everything and clear this because we'll need more space in order to articulate who are the Ilum or Ma and what is the connection of or Ma to or Na in the Bible. Now, if you're going to look up or Na, you should have an Ethiopic Bible and an Amharic Bible. If you look up in the English, very cleverly, the word has been translated in the English in a very dubious or curious way. But we're going to touch on that as we proceed in getting to the biblical roots of the Ormo. So, once again, this is Wendem Yadin, Ras Yadinos Teferi, and we say Shalom, Ras Teferi. <laughs>